Part one, section nine of the Maine Woods by Henry David Thoreau. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part one, Katahdin, section nine. We were soon at the Abeljacarmagus Falls. Anxious to avoid the delay, as well as the labor of the portage here, our boatmen went forward first to reconnoitre and concluded to let the bateau down the falls carrying the baggage only over the portage jumping from rock to rock until nearly in the middle of the stream we were ready to receive the boat and let her down over the first fall some six or seven feet perpendicular the boatmen stand upon the edge of a shelf of rock where the fall is perhaps nine or ten feet perpendicular in from one to two feet of rapid water one on each side of the boat and let it slide gently over till the bow is run out ten or twelve feet in the air then letting it drop squarely while one holds the painter the other leaps in and his companion following they are whirled down the rapids to a new fall or to smooth water in a very few minutes they had accomplished a passage in safety which would be as foolhardy for the unskilful to attempt as the descent of niagara itself it seemed as if it needed only a little familiarity and a little more skill to navigate down such falls as niagara itself with safety at any rate i should not despair of such men in the rapids above table rock until i saw them actually go over the falls so cool so collected so fertile in resources are they one might have thought that these were falls and that falls were not to be waded through with impunity like a mud puddle there was really danger of their losing their sublimity and losing their power to harm us familiarity breeds contempt the boatman pauses perchance on some shelf beneath a table rock under the fall standing in some cove of backwater two feet deep and you hear his rough voice come up through the spray coolly giving directions how to launch the boat this time having carried round pockwockamus falls our oars soon brought us to the katapsconigan or oak hall carry where we decided to camp halfway over leaving our bateau to be carried over in the morning on fresh shoulders one shoulder of each of the boatmen showed a red spot as large as one's hand worn by the bateau on this expedition and this shoulder as it did all the work was perceptibly lower than its fellow from long service such toil soon wears out the strongest constitution the drivers are accustomed to work in the cold water in the spring rarely ever dry and if one falls in all over he rarely changes his clothes till night if then even one who takes this precaution is called by a particular nickname or is turned off none can lead this life who are not almost amphibious mccausland said soberly what is at any rate a good story to tell that he had seen where six men were wholly under water at once at a jam with their shoulders to handspikes if the log did not start then they had to put out their heads to breathe the driver works as long as he can see from dark to dark and at night has not time to eat his supper and dry his clothes fairly before he is asleep on his cedar bed we lay that night on the very bed made by such a party stretching our tent over the poles which were still standing but re-shingling the damp and faded bed with fresh leaves in the morning we carried our boat over and launched it making haste lest the wind should rise the boatmen ran down passamagamet and soon after ambijigis falls while we walked round with the baggage we made a hasty breakfast at the head of ambijigis lake on the remainder of our pork and were soon rowing across its smooth surface again under a pleasant sky the mountain being now clear of clouds in the northeast taking turns at the oars we shot rapidly across deep cove the foot of pamadumcook and the north twin at the rate of six miles an hour the wind not being high enough to disturb us and reached the dam at noon the boatmen went through one of the log sluices in the bateau where the fall was ten feet at the bottom and took us in below here was the longest rapid in our voyage and perhaps the running this was as dangerous and arduous a task as any shooting down sometimes at the rate as we judged of fifteen miles an hour if we struck a rock we were split from end to end in an instant now like a bait bobbing for some river monster amid the eddies now darting to this side of the stream now to that 
gliding swift and smooth near to our destruction or striking broad off with the paddle and drawing the boat to right or left with all our might in order to avoid a rock i suppose that it was like running the rapids of the sault sainte marie at the outlet of lake superior and our boatmen probably displayed no less dexterity than the indians there do we soon ran through this mile and floated in quakish lake after such a voyage the troubled and angry waters which once had seemed terrible and not to be trifled with appeared tamed and subdued they had been bearded and worried in their channels pricked and whipped into submission with a spike pole and paddle gone through and through with impunity and all their spirit and their danger taken out of them and the most swollen and impetuous rivers seemed but playthings henceforth i began at length to understand the boatman's familiarity with and contempt for the rapids those fowler boys said mrs mccauslin are perfect ducks for the water they had run down to lincoln according to her thirty or forty miles in a bateau in the night for a doctor when it was so dark that they could not see a rod before them and the river was swollen so as to be almost a continuous rapid so that the doctor cried when they brought him up by daylight why tom how did you see to steer we didn't steer much only kept her straight and yet they met with no accident it is true the more difficult rapids are higher up than this when we reached the mill and knock it, opposite to tom's house and were waiting for his folks to set us over for we had left our bateau above the grand falls we discovered two canoes with two men in each turning up this stream from shad pond one keeping the opposite side of a small island before us while the other approached the side where we were standing examining the banks carefully for muskrats as they came along the last proved to be louis neptune and his companion now at last on their way up to chesuncook after moose but they were so disguised that we hardly knew them at a little distance they might have been taken for quakers with their broad-brimmed hats and overcoats with broad capes the spoils of bangor seeking a settlement in this sylvania or nearer at hand for fashionable gentlemen the morning after a spree met face to face these indians in their native woods looked like the sinister and slouching fellows whom you meet picking up strings and paper in the streets of a city there is in fact a remarkable and unexpected resemblance between the degraded savage and the lowest classes in a great city the one is no more a child of nature than the other in the progress of degradation the distinction of races is soon lost neptune at first was only anxious to know what we kill seeing some partridges in the hands of one of the party but we had assumed too much anger to permit of a reply we thought indians had some honour before but me been sick oh me unwell now you make bargain then me go they had in fact been delayed so long by a drunken frolic at the five islands and they had not yet recovered from its effects they had some young musquash in their canoes which they dug out of the banks with a hoe for food not for their skins for musquash are their principal food on these expeditions so they went on up the millinocket and we kept down the bank of the penobscot after recruiting ourselves with a draught of tom's beer leaving tom at his home thus a man shall lead his life away here on the edge of the wilderness on indian millinocket stream in a new world far in the dark of a continent and have a flute to play at evening here while his strains echo to the stars amid the howling of wolves shall live as it were in the primitive age of the world a primitive man yet he shall spend a sunny day and in this century be my contemporary perchance shall read some scattered leaves of literature and sometimes talk with me why read history then if the ages and the generations are now he lives three thousand years deep into time an age not yet described by poets can you well go further back in history than this ay ay for there turns up but now into the mouth of millinocket stream a still more ancient and primitive man whose history is not brought down even to the former in a bark vessel sown with the roots of the spruce with horn-beam paddles he dips his way along he is but dim and misty to me obscured by the eons that lie between the bark canoe and the bateau he builds no house of logs but a wigwam of skins he eats no hot bread and sweet cake 
but musquash and moose meat and the fat of bears he glides up the millinocket and is lost to my sight as a more distant and misty cloud is seen flitting by behind a nearer and is lost in space so he goes about his destiny the red face of man after having passed the night and buttered our boots for the last time at uncle george's whose dogs almost devoured him for joy at his return we kept on down the river the next day about eight miles on foot and then took a bateau with a man to pole it to matawamkeg ten more at the middle of that very night to make a swift conclusion to a long story we dropped our buggy over the half-finished bridge at old town where we heard the confused din and clink of a hundred saws which never rest and at six o'clock the next morning one of the party was steaming his way to massachusetts what is most striking in the maine wilderness is the continuousness of the forest with fewer open intervals or glades than you would imagine except the few burnt lands the narrow intervals on the rivers the bare tops of the high mountains and the lakes and streams the forest is uninterrupted it is even more grim and wild than you had anticipated a damp and intricate wilderness in the spring everywhere wet and miry the aspect of the country indeed is universally stern and savage excepting the distant views of the forest from hills and the lake prospects which are mild and civilizing in a degree the lakes are something which you are unprepared for they lie up so high exposed to the light and the forest is diminished to a fine fringe on their edges with here and there a blue mountain like amethyst jewels set around some jewel of the first water so anterior so superior to all the changes that are to take place on their shores even now civil and refined and fair as they can ever be these are not the artificial forests of an english king a royal preserve merely here prevail no forest laws but those of nature the aborigines have never been dispossessed nor nature disforested it is a country full of evergreen trees of mossy silver birches and watery maples the ground dotted with insipid small red berries and strewn with damp and moss-grown rocks a country diversified with innumerable lakes and rapid streams peopled with trout and various species of lucissi with salmon shad and pickerel and other fishes the forest resounding at rare intervals with the note of the chickadee the blue jay and the woodpecker the scream of the fish-hawk and the eagle the laugh of the loon and the whistle of ducks along the solitary streams at night with the hooting of owls and howling of wolves in summer swarming with myriads of black flies and mosquitoes more formidable than wolves to the white man such is the home of the moose the bear the caribou the wolf the beaver and the indian who shall describe the inexpressible tenderness and immortal life of the grim forest where nature though it be midwinter is ever in her spring where the moss-grown and decaying trees are not old but seem to enjoy a perpetual youth and blissful innocent nature like a serene infant is too happy to make a noise except by a few tinkling lisping birds and trickling rills what a place to live what a place to die and be buried in there certainly men would live forever and laugh at death and the grave there they could have no such thoughts as are associated with the village graveyard that make a grave out of one of those moist evergreen hummocks die and be buried who will i mean to live here still my nature grows ever more young the primitive pines among i am reminded by my journey how exceedingly new this country still is you have only to travel for a few days into the interior and back parts even of many of the old states to come to that very america which the northmen and cabot and gosnold and smith and raleigh visited if columbus was the first to discover the islands americus vaspucci and cabot and the puritans and we their descendants have discovered only the shores of america while the republic has already acquired a history world-wide america is still unsettled and unexplored like the english in new holland we live only on the shores of a continent even yet and hardly know where the rivers come from which float our navy the very timber and boards and shingles of which our houses are made grew but yesterday in a wilderness where the indian still hunts and the moose runs wild new york has her wilderness within her own borders 
and though the sailors of europe are familiar with the soundings of her hudson and fulton long since invented the steamboat on its waters an indian is still necessary to guide her scientific men to its headwaters in the adirondack country have we even so much as discovered and settled the shores let a man travel on foot along the coast from the passamaquoddy to the sabine or to the rio bravo or to wherever the end is now if he is swift enough to overtake it faithfully following the windings of every inlet and of every cape and stepping to the music of the surf with a desolate fishing town once a week and a city's port once a month to cheer him and putting up at the lighthouses where there are any and tell me if it looks like a discovered and settled country and not rather for the most part like a desolate island and no man's land we have advanced by leaps to the pacific and left many a lesser oregon and california unexplored behind us though the railroad and the telegraph have been established on the shores of maine the indian still looks out from her interior mountains over all these to the sea there stands the city of bangor fifty miles up the penobscot at the head of navigation for vessels of the largest class the principal lumber depot on this continent with a population of twelve thousand like a star on the edge of night still hewing at the forests of which it is built already overflowing with the luxuries and refinement of europe and sending its vessels to spain to england and to the west indies for its groceries and yet only a few axemen have gone up river into the howling wilderness which feeds it the bear and deer are still found within its limits and the moose as he swims the penobscot is entangled amid its shipping and taken by foreign sailors in its harbour twelve miles in the rear twelve miles of railroad are orono and the indian island the home of the penobscot tribe and then commence the bateau and the canoe and the military road and sixty miles above the country is virtually unmapped and unexplored and there still waves the virgin forest of the new world end of part one katahdin recording by expatriate in bangor maine